Paul is prisoner on a ship lost at sea before he eventually ends up in Rome. Finally, the gospel goes forth in the empire's capital city. On The Bible Brief. Have you reviewed the show? If you haven't left us a five-star review on your podcast platform, will you do that today? Reviews are a key way that new people find out about The Bible Brief. The wind had picked up, and the seas were the worst they'd been on the whole journey. The sailors called it a northeaster, an aggressive cyclone wind that couldn't be used to sail. Often it would spell death upon travelers in the Mediterranean, but so far the passengers in this boat had avoided that fate. The crew had been attempting to make it to a harbor called Phoenix, a harbor on the southern part of the large island of Crete. There they had hoped to spend the winter and rest from their laborsome journey. Ever since they had set sail from Myra in modern Turkey, the wind had been against them. And since their most recent port stop, the ferocity of the seas had only increased. This storm had made for difficult sailing, diffused morale, and drastic measures. Only recently they had jettisoned most of their food supply in an attempt to stabilize the tossing vessel that they traveled upon and the dark of the ocean was reflected by only further dark in the night. There was only gray by day and black in the night, as the sun and the stars were hidden from all view. The horizon revealed no land, and the tempest was driving the crew and the passengers to despair. Among them, almost all hope of salvation was abandoned, and many resigned themselves to death at sea. Paul, however, was among the prisoners on the ship, and despite the morale of his shipmates, he still retained the promise of continued life. Though the violence of death threatened, his hope remained, not least of all because of the visitations of Jesus and an angelic messenger from God. He remembered Jerusalem years ago, spending the night in the Roman barracks, a night where Jesus himself appeared to Paul saying, take courage, For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. That night, the gravity of his stay in the barracks was reduced by God's assurance of Paul's future. He wouldn't die there in Jerusalem. No, he would go on to Rome. Paul further recalled that midnight ride from Jerusalem on to Caesarea as he was accompanied, or rather protected, by 200 Roman soldiers, 70 Roman horsemen, and 200 Roman spearmen, protected from those Jews who sought his life. Over 40 Jews had sworn an oath to kill Paul and planned an event where the Romans would bring him out into the open to meet his fate. Their plan, however, was ill-conceived, as Paul's nephew came to find out about the conspiracy and informed the Roman leadership. That was why there was such a great company of soldiers protecting him on much of the journey to a new imprisonment in Caesarea. It hadn't been the worst quality of life there in Caesarea. While Paul was in custody, the governor did allow him to be attended by his friends in the city. Doubtless many of those who attended to him were the very same ones who tried in vain to convince him to never go to Jerusalem in the first place. Yet there in Caesarea, Paul had stayed for over two years, until a new Roman governor rose to rule over the province. With the new governor, the Jews from Jerusalem again came with false accusations. But this time, Paul was forced to exercise another right that he had as a Roman, the right to an appeal. Instead of going back to Jerusalem to be tried, he would go all the way to Rome in Italy to be tried before Caesar himself. Paul simply said, I appeal to Caesar, and the wheels began to turn that would take him far to the west, to a city church he'd written to, but not yet been able to visit. So now Paul found himself a prisoner in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, hearing the creaking and the straining wood of the storm-tossed boat. He was hungry and exhausted, but he had renewed hope, a hope that he shared with the discouraged and famished crew. He said this, I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God, 
to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on some island. Despite the poor conditions of the sea, Paul is reminded by an angel that Rome is his assured destination and that he will eventually stand before Caesar himself. Not only that, but the 275 people traveling with Paul will be saved from this storm as well. Now the others on board the large ship apparently didn't take Paul so much at his word. After all, he was just a prisoner. Some attempted to escape via a small boat, but none were successful in leaving the ship. For two whole weeks, they were tossed by the wind and waves, not knowing where they might end up. But soon, the fourteenth day was set to begin. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they didn't recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned if possible to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, and at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the Roman centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to the land. Just as the angel had indicated to Paul, so it happened. All the people on the ship came safely to land, and the Roman leader aboard the ship even spared the prisoners from an early death, thanks to him wanting to save Paul. But they were landed on an unknown island, with unfamiliar natives. Soon they learned that the island was called Malta, and the people there began to show them great kindness, immediately kindling a fire for the cold and wearied travelers. Paul was soon miraculously spared from a venomous snake bite as he was tending the fire, and this gave him an opening to bring the gospel to the people on the island. He prayed with the Roman official on the island, and he healed many of the people's diseases as he continued walking in the steps of Jesus empowered by the Holy Spirit. But finally, after spending a few months on Malta, the renewed crew set sail once again for Rome, having been supplied by the islanders and procuring a different boat. Paul's companion, Luke, records the group's arrival in Rome like this. And so we came to Rome, and the Christian brothers there, when they heard about us, came from far away to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and to speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Paul, after three days of respite among the Christians who'd come to welcome him to Rome, 
quickly gets to work. As was customary, he went to the Jews first. Though this time under house arrest, he instead requested that they come to him. Though they'd apparently heard about what they called the sect that Paul belonged to, they didn't know much about it except that it was apparently disfavored. Yet instead of rejecting Paul outright, they decide to give him a hearing. They scheduled the day, and then great numbers of them gathered at Paul's place of lodging to listen. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. Just as with other times sharing the gospel, there was a split in the hearers. Some believed and others rejected. Some were persuaded, others were hardened. Some had faith and others departed. But finally, as Paul saw them disagreeing among themselves instead of wholesale responding, he said this to the Jews gathered before him. The Holy Spirit was right in saying this to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet. Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Paul characterizes perhaps his whole ministry methodology in this short statement to the crowd that began to disperse immediately upon hearing it. The Jews were the carriers of God's great promises. They were the people with the hope of the Messiah. They were the ones among whom Jesus was born. Yet these people, as had happened for much of their history, largely blinded themselves to the truth. They closed their eyes to what was right in front of them. They rejected the Christ who came to reign over them in justice and righteousness. Some believed, but most rejected. And so Paul, as always in every city, turned from preaching to the Jews and preached to the Gentiles instead. What then are we to make of this Jewish rejection of the gospel? Why, when so many Jews saw the truth, those like Simon Peter and Paul and many others, Why did so many more reject? Will God forever reject His people, since they have rejected Him and His King? Have the people voided the covenants that God promised in ages past? Join us next time as we begin an exploration of the end of the story, bringing a resolution that causes every promise of God to bear fruit in abundance. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2023.